topic this week is Athena Doris. I've uh, prepared some slides. Yeah, I was going to make some kind of joke that my outlines have gone from text only items to graphics now. I've gotten an upgrade to my own noodle. So uh, everything will be graphics from here on out. And um, today is a, a presentation that is, uh, uh, the attendees come from uh, both the Stoic Salon in the UK and the Orlando Stoics in the USA. And the, uh, the person that we're looking at this week uh, is Athena Doris. Uh, he lived at the turn of the common era, which I find is an interesting time. But in his case, specifically, he influenced the Roman culture at a time when it was changing from a republic to an empire. And um, in addition to uh, drawing this week from Ryan Holiday's book called The Lives of the Stoics, uh, I'm also going to add some information from a Donald Robertson article and also from the IEP, which is the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So um, that will give us a little bit of a broader picture. Uh, the intro paragraph that I've picked comes from the IEP. It's the article on Stoicism, and it introduces Athena Doris and his part, his role in Roman history. Here's the quote. It says, Stoicism became important in Rome during the fraught time of the transition between the late Republic and the empire with Cato the Younger eventually becoming a role model for later Stoics because of his political opposition to the tyrant Julius Caesar. Sedley highlights two Stoic philosophers of the late first century BCE, Athena Doris of Tarsus and Arius Didymus as precursors to one of the greatest and most controversial Stoic figures, Seneca. Both Athena Doris and Arius were personal counselors to the first emperor. And uh, that's really going to be the focus today. What was he able to teach uh, to that future emperor? Well, to give you the early history, uh, his name uh, when he was uh, uh, young was Athena Doris Cananites, and his early years were uh, in this, um, what today is in southern Turkey. He was uh, born in a town called Kanana. It's kind of hard to pronounce, but I always think of that, that old band. Uh, you might remember the band called Shanana. So <laughs> I pronounce it Kanana. And I was going to, uh, I was actually thinking about having a picture of the, the lead singer for Shanana with that big mustache of his. But I decided, nah, this is an academic presentation. I'm going to leave that out. Uh, also, Athena Doris was a student to Posidonius. Uh, he was a student to his, both when the school was located at Rhodes and then later at Athens. And also, Athena Doris contributed to the writings of Cicero. Uh, he wrote a lot about uh, Panidius, who we've uh, discussed uh, a while back. And uh, this contributed to Cicero's works uh, specifically the work called On Duties, which is quite famous today. Now, the next part of uh, Athena Doris's history is interesting because he was a traveling teacher, and he didn't just stay in one town like some of the other Stoics did. Uh, he moved around the Mediterranean, which you see on the map here. He also went as far away as Egypt, which is in the lower right corner. And finally, he was hired to be the, uh, the teacher for Octavian. Uh, that was when he was about, uh, Athena, uh, Athena Doris was about 30 years old at the time. And um, this was the year 44 BC, by the way. Uh, he became the teacher for Octavian. He also became, uh, luckily, uh, the friend of this student because um, Octavian was kind of a, in some ways he was young and unstable and he also was very uh, superstitious. And um, yet he was thrust into being the emperor at an early age when he was only 19 years old. He was called to Rome because uh, Caesar had been murdered. That was also the year 44 BC, I believe. And so he very much needed uh, his friend and teacher to follow him, which is what happened. Octave Octavian went to Rome first, I believe, and then Athena Doris followed him there. Now, the next part of the story is part of the teaching that Athena Doris uh, prepared for 
Octavian as emperor. And this is a famous ghost story, which you can find several articles and videos on YouTube about. Um, some scholars believe that Athenodorus created this story to teach Octavian a lesson about superstitious values, but um, the scholars today ultimately don't know if, if uh, Athenodorus was being truthful about this story or not, but the story goes that Athenodorus rented this large mansion in Athens, and in prior years, the, the mansion uh, had reported that many people were quite terrified of the place, that there was um, there were sounds of chains being dragged across the floors or through the house, and uh, they would get closer and closer, and people would basically not be able to sleep there because it was um, um, it was so terrifying. And so, despite these uh, stories of being haunted, Athena Doris stayed in the in the house the first night after he rented it, and he started doing some of his work, and that's when the sounds of the chains started. And they came closer and closer until they were in the same room with him. And he supposedly saw the figure, the ghostly figure of, of a, an old man, very emaciated and rattling these chains and moaning. But uh, the, the funny part of this story is that Athena Doris paused and just said that the ghost should wait for a moment while he finished his work. <laughs> it's such a funny picture to imagine in your mind. But after a moment then, he finished his work and he got up and he followed the ghost to where it was going and it took him outside to some place on the grounds and then it disappeared into the night air. Well, what happened next, uh, the next day that is, is Athena Doris had some workers dig up the ground on that spot and uh, that's where the ghost had vanished and they did find bones there. So what Athena Doris decided to do was to dig up those bones and rebury them at a public funeral. And supposedly the ghost was never seen again. Now this story, for those of you who are into the history, uh, it was recorded by Pliny the Younger who wrote many such letters of the lives of people in that time. And uh, some of us today uh, say that it's the oldest ghost story on record in history. Um, I, I, I'm a little doubtful of that because even if this was a ghost story from 50 BC or thereabouts, uh, we still have stories like uh, the Odyssey by Homer, which goes back, I think, to 800 BC, and that has the images or the ideas of spirits of the dead. So it might not be the oldest ghost story, but it is a famous one. Now, in, uh, before we go to the next slide, the stoic lesson that we can get out of this is that when you are faced with some new situation as a practicing stoic, or maybe if it's, it's even a scary situation, you need to remember to stay rational and to show some courage. I know that uh, uh, for me over the years, I have not had any supernatural uh, experiences like that, but I have stayed in houses that were supposedly haunted. And um, I don't know honestly how I would react if I saw an apparition in the air, but I would hope that my stoic training would help me deal with that. All right, the next slide is the influence that Athena Doris had on Seneca the Younger. Uh, in the chapter by uh, Ryan Holiday, he goes on to say that Athena Doris was an influence uh, on Seneca because Seneca lived a short time after him. And Seneca liked his ideas on keeping your tranquility, the importance of doing so. This I think is of course, one of the important elements of modern stoicism that we want to keep our tranquility if possible. And um, it's not just a good attribute for us today in the modern world, but think about it back then in the time of Athena Doris when he was counseling emperors, how important is it that an emperor should try to keep his tranquility and not go off the rails? That's um, I think a very important thing. Today, we could also connect this with the idea of keeping our focus, not just the tranquility, but the focus that goes along with it. And a mental retreat. I've got a picture of, uh, of a walking meditation going on there. But um, uh, going back to the, the teachings of Athena Doris, he did believe that the mind needs rest. It's very important for us to take a rest somehow, uh, whatever works in our lifestyle. But uh, without that rest, our mind can become strained or even resort to vices. And uh, he tells uh, the story of Socrates how 
Socrates would sometimes take a break from his uh, work and he would play games with the kids just to have some playtime. Uh, I think that uh, today, the way that we can achieve meditation, it's often talked about that we can do breath work. We can meditate by sitting somewhere quietly, maybe with music, maybe with incense, kind of a Buddhist uh, version of that. Uh, or one of my favorites is a walking meditation. I still remember the first time I went on a walking meditation years ago, two venerables were walking around the building at a Buddhist temple and 10 people were following them. And I remember what a calming effect it had for me, how everything in my mind just seemed to slow down. I really enjoyed that, that experience. I, I hope you'll try it if you um, have not yet tried a walking meditation. And uh, now we come to the famous advice to Octavian. Athena Doris advised him with this, a quote, this is one of the translations. Whenever you feel yourself getting angry, Caesar, don't say or do anything until you've repeated the 24 letters of the alphabet to yourself. Well, of course, what he's talking about there, those 24 letters, I believe, are the Greek letters. Greek uh, alphabet still has 24 letters today. And um, I think that this is an important quote, um, really, to, to, take, uh, to, to follow the ideas of Donald Robertson. Donald has an article on this exact quote where he says that this is a gift to anger management today. It's the idea that counting numbers one to 10 or counting letters in the alphabet, whatever works for you, is a therapeutic answer. Uh, it's a timeout. And basically for some people, I think that's very important that you have that pause to process your feelings before you act on any feelings of anger or upset. And of course, there's a lot of ways we can do that today, but this, this I think is still an important, a timeless answer to the um, anger management issues that pe people have today. Uh, before we uh, wrap up, I've got this slide. We're near the end, but uh, I had to make this historical clarification is that late in the chapter, I don't know why, but Ryan switches from the name Octavian to Augustus. And he's really talking about the same person. He didn't give any explanation for this in the chapter. Maybe the chapter was a little short or maybe it was from an earlier draft. But when he refers to Augustus in the, at the end of the chapter, he's talking about the name that was refer, uh, that referred to the person as emperor because the name changed. You see, when Octavian was uh, early in life, his name was Gaius Octavius. And then he, his name changed to Octavian, which is what most of the scholars talk about today or use that name because it differentiates him from all others. And then when he became heir to the throne, when Julius Caesar named him heir, he named him Gaius Julius Caesar. And then finally, as emperor, he took the name Caesar Augustus. So all of these names are the same person. I just had to take the time to, um, to break that down. And there's a great article in Britannica if you'd like to review that more. So now we come to the last slide. Uh, how can we link these teachings to modern Stoicism? Because we still have stress today we still have issues dealing with focus, uh, with trying to keep our tranquility. And the way that I would break this down is uh, item number one here, using reason. Uh, we need to realize that we are rational beings. And when some new event happens, sometimes it's easy to say, let's stay calm. But it's only with practice, I think, that we can truly achieve that state where we are calm and rational. And uh, number two, Practicing courage, this is another thing that's easy to say, but harder to do. Uh, when you're in some new situation, I know when I first uh, started public speaking, I was really nervous. I could feel myself, you know, sitting aside from the podium. My heart would be thumping. Boy, I'd be so nervous. Like, what am I going to say? How am I going to say it? How will people hear it? But uh, it's with practice that I became more confident in doing public speaking. And so practicing courage is something really for every part of our life. And um, if we can uh, just find ways of, of doing that, perhaps practicing with, it could be Athena Doris and his story about the ghost story, or it could be other 
people that you admire in history. Uh, whatever works for you is, is best. And uh, finally, stoic tranquility. We've talked about this already a little bit, but it is the product, I think, of many things. It could be a part of your weekly stoic practice. It could be the stoic tools that you've learned of over time. And you might even bring in things from other areas. Um, could be some Buddhist or Taoist thinking or other areas of philosophy that help you in keeping your tranquility. And I think that uh, many of us have a fusion of ideas today. So um, that's, uh, that's one way to think about it. And I think that the important thing is when you practice this stoic tranquility and thinking long enough, it really does become a part of you, becomes a part of your nature so that you won't really have to think about it much. It'll just naturally flow for you.